Uh, so, Mark, uh, I don't know if you can see that the link is already in the chat. The answer the same data. I'm sorry, Libby, can you just uh, repeat that again? Can you repeat? Oh.
Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, Play Therapy online presentation. My name is Marijke Smilders, and I'm a child therapist with Renaissance, and I'm very happy that you could join us today. Uh, please take note that the session will be recorded and that it will also be live broadcasted on our Facebook page. Um, I see that there are people still joining us, but I'm going to start and they can join us where we are. All right, so like I've mentioned, I'm Marika Smilders, I'm a child therapist, and I initially started my career as a social worker, working in South Africa, I worked in child protection, and um, I also worked in the children's courts doing child um, children's court investigations to determine whether a child was in need of care and protection. And after that, I specialized in um, counseling with children, um, counseling uh, families, and uh, yes, went on to specialize in, in play-based interventions. In South Africa, I also worked uh, as a play therapist at a private practice where I was also trained in doing animal assisted play therapy. Uh, simultaneously, I worked as a counseling social worker as well, doing school counseling and also doing employee wellness programs at various corporate companies. After working in South Africa, I moved to the Netherlands for a couple of years and there I had the opportunity to work as a social worker with undocumented refugees and also founded a children's practice called the Play Express that rendered child coaching, play therapy, and parenting support services. So that's just a little bit about me, who I am, but I would really like to, to get to know you um, a little bit. Uh, Time-wise, we are going to take about a 45 minutes presentation. We are going to do a couple of techniques in between, and then there's also going to be enough time uh, to discuss and to, to answer any questions. So um, please take into account that it might take up to 90 minutes. Um, I'm going to refer to my colleague Luby throughout the, the presentation. She is uh, going to help me with all the online technical matters. Um, so yes, I'm going to switch off my video now and then I am going to ask you to introduce yourself, but I'm going to ask you to do that in a specific way. So let me just uh, stop my video and then I'm going to go to the next slide. So I would like you to write down in the chat box, please, what is your name? And I would like you to share what was your favorite thing that you played with as a child growing up? It can be a toy, it can be a game, it can be any object. And I also want you to include, why did you enjoy playing with this? Or yes, why was it your favorite toy? So just take a moment and please share in the chat box um, just answer those questions for me. I'm really curious to see what you what you share. So for those who have just joined us, uh, I ask you to to write your name in the chat box and just to uh, tell me what was your favorite thing that you played with when you grew up um, as a child, maybe a, you know, a toy, a game or any object, it can be anything. So please just share in the chat box, um, what was your favorite thing to play with and why you enjoy, enjoyed playing with this object. So please feel free to share that in the chat box. Okay, so I see that there's a teddy bear. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yes, so it brings back some memories. Brings back some memories, the teddy bear. I can perhaps share what my favorite thing uh, to play with was with um, growing up. It was actually a book, so it was more of an object. And um, I, I think I got the book when I was about four years old. And my mom read the book to me quite often. And so I would recite the words and I would pretend that I would be able to read this book. So this was, of course, before I went to school. Um, 
But so when I went to school, uh, the first day at school, my parents asked me, so what did you do? What did you learn? And I said, no, I learned how to read. And then I took out my favorite book and I read the whole story or just recited the whole story and pretended that I could read. But I remember that book so clearly and it was something that I always had with me and loved to, to play with. Um, so that is really my favorite thing that I played with growing up. And of course, later sports and things uh, became more important, but uh, initially it was that book. Anybody else who would like to share in the chat box? Just write your name and the favorite thing that you played with as a child. All right, so Esther said her favorite toy was a doll. She enjoyed playing with it um, because I adored being a mom. <laughs> oh yes, that's, that's of course playing with a doll. It brings out those, those roles, right? Uh, caring and nurturing for that doll and uh, yes tending to the child when when the child the baby is crying and feeding oh thank you thank you for sharing Esther anybody else who would like to share in the chat box just write your name and the favorite thing that you played with your favorite toy or game growing up it can be anything All right, I'm going to move on. So uh, please feel free to, to, to keep on sharing as we go. Um, just uh, writing down uh, what is your favorite toy and your favorite game and why you enjoyed playing with it as a child. I'm just letting some people in that's in the waiting room. Uh, all right, okay. Um, sorry. Okay, so now I have a next question for you. Now, seeing that we are going to talk about play, play therapy today, I want us to, yeah, just sort of tap into our creative minds. But the first question that I have is, what is this? What do you see on the screen? And I would also like you just to share in, in the chat box what you see. All right, so somebody said a log from a tree, right? Anybody else who would like to share? Ah, oh, okay, Carol, I see what you, what you did there. You're on the right track. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. And so now the question is, think like a child. Is this still a stick or is it something else? So try to think creatively. What would a child see? Is this still a stick or is it something else? And you can, you can write your answer if you like in the chat box. Aha, I see Cynthia said a sword. And you are correct because this is not just a stick. It's a wand or it's a guitar, it's a shovel, it's a horse. It can really be anything to a child. Uh, when they play, they really unlock their imagination and creativity. Um, so they can create their own world. So even a thing like a silly stick can become something like a microphone or a paddle. And I really enjoy uh, this, this little poem. It says, a stick is an excellent thing. If you find the perfect one, it is a scepter for a king. A stick is an excellent thing. It's a magic wand, it's yours to fling, to strum a fence, to draw the sun. A stick is an excellent thing if you find the perfect one. So that really just summarizes a child's creativity, that they can see a stick, they can use it, they can play with it, and it can become something else. So just to give you an outline of today's presentation, we are going to talk a bit about what are the six benefits of play, why playing is important, we are going to look at play therapy in more detail. What is it? When is it helpful? Uh, we are going to look at the different play materials and the different forms of play. Um, we will also look at the play therapy process. And I will focus a bit more on emotional awareness and how to create that within a child during the play therapy process. Um, we are also going to look at what to expect when taking your child to play therapy 
and then there will be opportunity for questions and discussion. So now I'm going to pose another question and this time I want you to feel free to switch on your video to unmute yourself and just to share why do you think play is important? Anybody feel free to just jump in and share why you think play is important. Hello. Hi. Hi, Esther. How are you? I'm okay, thank you. And how are you? I'm good, thanks. Why do you think play is important? Well, it's important because it allows a child to form their own constructs of knowledge mm -hmm. and to make yes. sense out of things. Yes. It's, it's sort of a way that helps them to, to explore their own world, right? It's how they learn. It's how they gain knowledge. Yes. Thank you very much for that. Great. Anybody else who would like to share why they think playing is important? also helps them learn about friendships and communication with other people and how to behave with other people. Yes, of course. They learn important things like verbal cues, how to communicate, how to negotiate group dynamics in a bigger group. So those are very important social skills that you learn when you play, right? Yes. Anybody else who would like to share? All right, so we, we see that playing is not just all fun and games. It is, of course, but it's not just what it is. It's also an important teaching tool. Through play, kids learn how to interact with others and they learn how to develop critical lifelong skills. And so what I want us to do is just to quickly look at the six benefits of play. And we can group them into six broad categories. So the first one is the physical importance of playing. So active play helps kids develop hand-eye coordination, balance, gross motor skills. For example, when a child plays outside on a jungle gym, uh, they have to climb, they, they learn how to develop those crucial skills. Rough and tumble play are also gross motor skills that children develop when they, when they play. And it also helps them to spend their natural energy, of course, which uh, promotes better eating and sleeping habits. So truly being active, is, is a, it has a physical benefit uh, of playing when a child plays. The cognitive benefit is where, where children learn how to think, how to reason, how to pay attention, how to solve problems. If you build a puzzle, if you uh, play with building blocks, you learn how to solve a problem or how to get from point A to point B or how the things fit together. And those are critical cognitive skills that children develop when they are playing. This, uh, the third uh, benefits of playing is of course the creative aspects. And that's what we just did with the stick. So to, to an adult, it might look like a stick or a re regular stick, you know, nothing more to it. But to a child, when they play, it unlocks their imagination and it helps them to engage in fantasy play, pretend play, um, and it helps them to create new worlds and form unique ideas and solutions to challenges that they might be facing. Of course, as Carol mentioned, um, as well, to, to play helps a child to learn how to communicate with others. They learn about verbal and nonverbal uh, messages. They learn about different social cues. They can exchange their thoughts, information, or messages by speech um, and also receive cues from others. So that it's very important for their communication skills as well. If we look at the social benefits of play, of course, um, when a child plays in a group, they learn how to negotiate group dynamics. They learn what behaviors are accepted within this group, what behaviors are not accepted. They learn how to compromise, they learn how to wait, and they learn how to be patient um, when they interact in a group. 
It also helps them to deal with others' feelings and to share their own feelings, of course. And then the emotional aspects. Uh, when children play, they learn about uh, their own emotions, but of course, the social aspect also learning about the emotions of others. They learn about things like fear, frustration, uh, and aggression, how to uh, express it in a, in a way that is acceptable within my group. Um, and they also learn how to, to practice empathy and understanding. Um, so playing really has these broad six uh, great benefits. So it's not just uh, a senseless activity, but it has so much more to it. It's such an important uh, teaching tool where children develop critical skills and learn how to interact with others. Now, if we look at play therapy, we can say that it is a, a, a form of psychotherapy for children. Now, we as adults, when we go through something that is very challenging or when we are having a bad day, we tend to talk about it. We express ourselves verbally. We can either talk to a friend, a family member, or even a counselor, but we, we tend to talk and interact and engage with someone else. Now, children, unfortunately do not have that vocabulary or verbal capacity yet to do so, to express themselves verbally or to tell somebody this happened to me and I'm so upset about this. Um, unfortunately, they cannot do that yet. But we know that playing is the natural language of the child. And it's a way that they express themselves. So they either express themselves verbally or non-verbally, um, but it's a way that they can express themselves and share their thoughts and experiences. So, so for a child to talk about something can be too frightening. But when they play it out, sometimes they play it out unconsciously, you know, what is troubling them. It creates this enormous relief um, when they are able to express what they are uh, feeling or experiencing at that moment. So we can say play therapy is used, or play is used, when children experience social, emotional, and behavioral difficulties. And as we've mentioned, playing is the natural language of the child. And play therapy thus creates a safe environment where a child can work through their problems. Um, and, and, and we see also that during play therapy, we make use of different play materials and different forms of play. We will discuss this in more detail a bit later on. But the words, or rather the play materials that a child use during play therapy, in essence becomes their words to tell their story. The focus is uh, especially on making contact in the here and the now, in the present, engaging with the child in the present moment. And it also helps to encourage the child to, to engage with symbolic play and to use fantasy and imagination. Um, and of course, parents play an active and supportive role during the play therapy process. Now, when I say that, um, it means that parents can sometimes be involved in this process. They can be, become part of the session if you want to enhance the child-parent relationship. Um, but the parents are also very much important when it comes to supporting the child to reach the treatment goals. Sometimes a child will get some homework to do at home and the parent would need to, to, to make sure that the child does the homework or motivate the child to go to these sessions. So the parents are also uh, seen as a partner and, and play a very supportive role. Now, just going back to making contact in the here and the now during play therapy, play therapy direct experience is used as a tool. And the focus is always on the here and the now, on the present. It focuses on promoting the child's awareness in the present. So not necessarily focusing on the past or on the future or how the past influenced your, your present, but, but rather, uh, sorry, not dwelling on the past, but rather viewing it in a way like, how is the past, how is it influencing me now, today, here where I am, and how can I deal with that? Now, the different play materials uh, and the different forms of play that we use during play therapy can be grouped into 
to different forms. For example, you get creative play, biblio play, dramatic play, assessment play, and relaxation play. And as I've mentioned, these play materials become the words that the children use to tell their stories. So for example, a creative play activity would be to paint or it would be to draw something. So it really stimulates the child's creativity. It's, it's aimed at helping to ventilate feelings. So you can imagine playing with sand or playing with clay, um, uh, building something with blocks. It is something creative. It, it helps, it, it stimulates you in a creative way. Um, the second aspect, if we look at biblio play, biblio play is, is a word that's derived from books. So think about, imagine journaling or paging through a book or telling a story. Those are things that, that leads to the, to the development of insights and working through your feelings. So you can make a collage, you can work on a life book. Those are the type of activities that you would do during biblio play. Now, dramatic play, as you can see, the child playing with two puppets on the screen. Uh, dramatic play has various functions, like remodeling your family life or expression of aggression or regression or playing out a specific feeling. Um, you can replay or you can work through traumatic experience. And um, you, can, you can use a range of materials, not just puppets, but for example, uh, making masks or playing with a play phone. It sort of initiates and facilitates conversation. When you play with puppets, the one puppet speaks to another and they interact and a dialogue takes place. And this is sort of a way for you as the therapist to also engage and to take part in the dialogue in a playful manner. Now, relaxa relaxation play is aimed at reducing a child's Tension. It helps them to open up a bit more. Um, it helps them to relax. And it also helps to build the therapeutic relationship. I will talk more about this in a little while, about the therapeutic relationship and the importance thereof. Um, but many things can be used to help a child uh, to, to relax. So you can see the child on the screen playing with a drum, with a musical instrument. Um, you can build puzzles or you can just play uh, different games like Uno or Jenga. It's really re relaxing and it's fun. So assessment play is generally used to assess the, the child's skills. You know, what is their phase of development? Do they have any feeling language or what are their verbal skills? Are they able to interact with you verbally? Can they master their environment? And uh, for this form of play, you would use things like uh, maybe playing games such as chess or uh, linking sentences to different pictures or building wooden blocks and to see if the child can follow the instructions. Um, so, so these are things that you use to assess um, the child's skills. Play therapy can be helpful when a child has gone through a traumatic experience. So you can imagine when a child has gone through abuse or neglect or if there's a loss of a significant person. Um, it can also be helpful when a child struggles with aggressive behaviors like um, anger outbursts or when a child doesn't know how to express their emotions in a safe way. When a child experiences symptoms of depression, stress, and anxiety, when a child is very much anxious going to school or when they have to, to, to do something online or when they have to present something to their class, this can cause a lot of anxiety to a child. So it can be really helpful for a child to, to go to play therapy to help them deal and cope with these, um, you know, these emotions. And, and when they are anxious or when they are scared about something. When a child experiences uh, attachment difficulties, such as separation anxiety, when a child struggles to separate from their parents, or when there are some attachment issues in the parent-child relationship, it can also be helpful when a child has limited social and emotional skills. And as we have said in the beginning, um, playing really promotes and has a lot of benefits. So when a child has limited social and emotional skills, play therapy can really be useful and can help a child to develop those skills because they can do it in a safe environment and they can practice those crucial skills 
uh, with the play therapist in a playful way. Play therapy can also be um, helpful when a child is going through a parental conflict, like a separation or like a divorce. And now we know that children have magical thinking. Sometimes they might think that it's their fault that their parents are separating. And so they might carry all this guilt and these feelings of it's my fault. I shouldn't have been unruly because that's why they are separating. So play therapy in essence really helps children to, to reframe those thoughts and to work through those feelings because you also need to validate those feelings and to, to acknowledge those feelings. And it's okay to feel like that. But let's try and reframe your thoughts and let's try to, to look at this situation in a different way. All right. Play therapy. Um, also, or, or the play therapist also helps the child to develop more helpful behaviors. Um, it helps them to understand and process and regulate their emotions. So an emotion is a very, uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult construct to understand if you don't have any experience with it. Uh, it might be different, difficult to, to name an emotion or to recognize an emotion. So you need to, to develop emotional awareness to be able to express those emotions. And that is what the play therapist helps the child with, is really to understand their emotions, to recognize the different emotions that you experience. And the therapist also helps the child to regulate, in other words, how to deal with these emotions. When I'm very angry, how can I help myself to calm down, to deal through these, this anger, and you know how to ground myself again and how do I cope with this anger so that I can continue with the rest of my day. Because a lot of kids who do not yet have the skills to self-regulate, uh, they get sometimes they get stuck in this emotion. For example, they get stuck in anger. So they can throw a tantrum, they are very angry. And to us, it might feel like, okay, the child has had the opportunity to express himself. They should be able to move on. But sometimes kids get stuck in that emotion and they can stay angry for the rest of the day. So that is why during play therapy, you really help the child understand, process and regulate what they are experiencing. Of course, the therapist also helps the child to develop positive coping and problem solving skills. Um, and the therapist also helps them to gain insight. Um, about resolving inner conflicts that they might have. Now, um, as I've mentioned before, the parent also plays a supportive role uh, and helps the child to achieve the different treatment goals. But the therapist also works closely with the parent by providing continuous feedback and telling them how the process is going. The therapist will never share anything that the child is not comfortable to share with the parents. So when I have a session with a parent, maybe after the third play therapy session, I will have an evaluation and a feedback session with the parents. But prior to that session, I will have a talk with the child and say, okay, I'm going to have a feedback session with the parents, and this is what I'm going to share. Are you comfortable with that? Because, of course, play therapy is a safe environment, and the child um, trusts the play therapist. And that is why um, I need to get the consent of the child with what I'm going to share. And I'm just going to provide general feedback of what I am observing during these sessions, of course, and um, yeah, provide a bit of feedback on, on, on the whole process and on the child's process. Now, just to come back to what the therapist helps the child to do in play therapy, when a child experiences um, problems within their social relationships. For example, the child is very timid uh, and doesn't really know how to make friends or find it a bit frightening to, to engage with other kids at school. Um, they might not have, have the, the, the confidence to go to a group of kids and to ask them whether um, that child can play with them. So that might be something that can cause a lot of anxiety with the child and it can cause feelings of loneliness um, because the child's not able to socially engage with other children. So once we have identified that uh, in the play therapy process, I can help the child to, to practice those skills. I am seen as the child's playmate. I am a friend. I'm a confidant. 
I can help the child to practice these different types of behaviors. For example, practice with the child, maybe using puppets or using dolls or playing it out, this whole scenario on the, on the, the, the playground. But I can help the child to walk up to those kids and to ask them, hey, can I join you in this game? We can practice that in a, and it's in a non-threatening environment. It's in a safe environment. So that when the child actually goes to do it in real life, the child will have the confidence to do it because they have practiced that behavior before. Or, for example, when a child has uh, difficulty sharing with others or they have difficulty to control their impulses, to wait, they don't have the patience. When you play a game, for example, a card game, you would have to wait your turn for the next player. And so this is the type of things that I address during play therapy and say, oh, you have to wait your turn. I first have to draw my card, then it's your turn. So it might seem like a simple thing, but it's a crucial social skill that you develop because you practice with a child, you practice new behaviors and you help them to control their impulses. And the child also sees, okay, what is uh, socially appropriate? Now, I want to talk a bit about the sand tray and sand play. Now, uh, it might seem like a, a, a strange construct or a strange idea, but sand play is something that we use during the play therapy process. And we use sand play because it's really a very sensory uh, experience for a child playing with sand. Now, um, sand play, of course, is uh, it consists of uh, a sand tray. So you have a sand tray container, like a plastic container or a wooden box container that is filled with sand. And then you, as the therapist, invite the child to play with the sand and you invite the child to create their own world within this sand tray. So they play with different figures in this sand tray. So sand play, in essence, is a form of non-directive projective play. So what I mean by that, a child can create their own world in a sand tray and they can project their feelings and thoughts onto the different figurines and in the different scenarios that they create within their sand tray. Children can create landscapes, pictures, abstract content, the concepts in a sand tray. It gives them boundaries to create something in a world where they can control. And as I've said, they use miniature figures in the sand tray. Now, as I've mentioned, playing with sand has a, a sensory value to it. Um, and you have the boundaries set in a box. So the child can control what's happening in this box, in the sand tray. Um, and they can also experience control because a lot of the times children don't have any control over what's happening to them. When a parent is separating or when a parent is going through divorce, the child doesn't have any control. Their whole life is changing. They need to adjust and adapt, but they have no say and they have no control. So in this sand tray, in this box, the child really has the opportunity to take control, you know, to place a figure here and I'm gonna place a figure over here. And this is the story that I'm going to tell. And by doing that, they take control of the action and they experience control. The sand play or in the sandbox also helps a child to, to handle traumas because they can externalize, you know, push away from them what happened or they can externalize fantasies in this box by placing the different figurines. And it also provides them a sense of control over their inner impulses. It can also, very important, encourage verbal discussion where a child has poor verbal skills. So the child might not be able to verbally express what's happening in the sand tray, or they cannot say the world that they have created. They cannot perhaps um, narrate it to you, but it, it does give you as a therapist the opportunity to engage in a bit of dialogue with the child, especially when the child has poor verbal skills and it facilitates conversation. It also encourages the expression of emotions and it helps the child to take part in symbolic play. Now, I'm going to go to the next slide so long. And in this slide, my colleague Luby, she is going to share the, um, the link in the chat box. I want you to click on the link that's onlinesandtray.com. I want you to open a new tab and click on that link so long. It takes a while to load. 
But I'm still just going to, to mention a couple of things about SANT as a projective technique. But in the meantime, you can open a new tab and go to that link, online SANT tray. And Luby will share the link in the chat box. So how to use SANT play with a child and how to use it as a projective technique. Now, the play therapist invites the child to play with SANT and to choose the miniature toys that they want to play with. So that's really the first step. You put the sandbox on a table um, and you have a display of all the sand tray uh, figurines, the mini figurines, and you tell the child to, okay, choose a couple of the figures so you have a variety of figures that the child can, can play with and can choose from. And so you really invite the child to, to pick out the ones that they would like to play with. Now, you can either tell the child to create their own world, or you can tell the child to make a specific scene in the sand tray. For example, you can make a scene about how it feels when the kids at school are bullying you. So you can either give the child a very specific instruction, or you can uh, just keep it general, like create your own world. Um, all right, and so, while the child is busy constructing this scene, me as the therapist, I will talk as little as possible. I will uh, not interrupt the child and I will really just observe what the child is doing. Unless the child asks for help, I will answer the questions, but really just sit back and observe. And after this child now has maybe collected 10 figurines and they have started to, to make their own uh, sand tray world, um, you know, created their own world in the sand tray, you can ask the child after it has been constructed, like, please describe the scene or maybe tell a story about it, what's happening um, in, your, in your story. And you can ask the child to identify with different objects or to carry out a dialogue between the different objects. And the therapist can look at the scene and can communicate a general idea about it. Like, oh, I see that you are standing, the, 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 I see that the zebra is standing quite far away from the, the hippopotamus. Uh, so you can make general observations and then you can also ask the child to, to maybe carry on a dialogue. So what would the hippopotamus say to the zebra? And let's say, for example, you are the lion and you ask the lion, please tell me about what's happening around you. So it's just a general way of really uh, initiating a dialogue with the child. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to go to this, uh, to this website just to give you an idea of what I expect you to do. So what I want you to do is I want you to create your own sand tray and it's going to be online. And I want you to take five minutes and create your, your week. Just in your sand tray, what your week looked like. So let me stop sharing. I'm going to go to that website and then I'm going to reshare my screen. Just a moment. So if you go to this website, you will see that there is a sand tray. And in the sand tray, you can create your own week. Now, there are different figures to choose from. If you look at the first page, there are different mythical creatures that you can choose from and can scroll down and select. If you want to select a sand, uh, or if you want to select a figure, you can click on it and it will appear in your sand tray. Then you can move it around anywhere you like. If you want to delete it, you can just backspace or delete on the top. So you can move through the different figures and try to create your own week. And so you will see that there are human figures, there's insects, animals, uh, there are water bodies or uh, water transport, different army, and you can see that there are some medical equipment and things. Uh, there's vehicles and buildings infrastructure, and of course, uh, different types of elements. So I would like you just to take, I'm going to uh, take three minutes, three to five minutes, and I would like you to create your own world in the sand tray. And once you have done that, I will just give you an indication and then I would like to ask people to share.
their experience or to share what they have made. So you can either share your screen of what you made and you can show us your sand tray and just share a couple of experiences, how it was for you to create the sand tray. Is it clear? Does anybody have any questions about this exercise? All right, I take that as a no, that everything is clear. So take uh, three to five minutes and I want you just to create your own work, to create your week in the sand tray. Yes, so I see uh, you said that you are asking, you are using your phone. It is supposed to be uh, mobile friendly as well. But so you said that if you press on it, it doesn't appear in the sand tray. Okay, let's take about another minute and then I'm going to ask you to share your experience.
All right. Is there anybody who would like to share what they made in their sand tray or just share a general experience of how it was to go through the different figurines and uh, the process that they went to to create their picture? Um, also, feel free to, if you want to share, to share your screen as well so that we can see your uh, your sand tray, or you can just describe it to us as well. So please, if there's anybody, feel free to share your experiences of the sand play and the sand tray. Is there anybody who would like to share? Please feel free to speak up, to switch on your video, to unmute yourself. If there's anybody who would like to share their experience. I can perhaps tell you about the sand tray that I made and then hopefully it will encourage others to, to speak up as well. So the one that I'm projecting on the screen at the moment is, well, not how my week was this week, but last week. So um, last week uh, I went camping. And so that's why you see all the different, uh, the different animals in my sand tray. And um, just a yeah, funny thing is somebody at the campsite hurt themselves and that person didn't have a first aid kit and so um, I was rushing to find the first aid kit and I could find it and then opening up this first aid kit and I didn't know oh goodness how should I stop the bleeding what should I do should I first spray on wound spray uh, do I clean it first how does it work so it was just total chaos um, but luckily we had this first aid kit, but then I needed just to remind myself, okay, just whew, calm down, just take it step by step, you will figure it out. And luckily we were able to, to, to treat the, the, the person's wound. But so in that moment of all the chaos, it, I was a bit stressed out, you know, knowing that I had this important role um, and I had to help this person, but not really knowing how to do it. Um, uh, so, so I guess that was just something that I brought into my sand tray, that feeling of, whoo, okay, uh, chaos at the one moment, and then just trying to calm yourself down as well. And then after you've done that, feeling like a lion, you know, somebody who stepped up and who was able to treat a wound and, uh, you know, the confidence that that, that brought. That's just a, a little bit of a, um, yeah explanation of what my sand tray might mean. Um, anybody else who would like to share? Now, usually when the child has created a sand tray, you can, you can ask the child to describe the general scene, okay? So for example, mine is a camping scene. Uh, there are different animals. Uh, there's a vehicle. Uh, there are different activities, different things going on in the sand tray. And so you, you would ask the child to describe what's happening here. Maybe you can ask the child to tell a story about what's happening. Um, Sorry, you can also uh, uh, tell the child to, okay, tell me what happens in your sand tray. And you can ask the child to identify with different objects. For example, what would the lion say to the first aid kit? Or what would the vehicle say to the zebra? So that the different components can engage in a sort of a dialogue, can carry on a dialogue with one another. Then, um, you can, you can also, like I've mentioned in the beginning, you can look at the scene and you can communicate a general idea about it. Some kids might have a very disorganized sand tray. Um, other kids will have a more organized uh, sand tray or it will only be grouped into one corner um, or it might be scattered. So you can try to, to generally observe these things and to relay it back to the child and ask them about it. 
Um, and then you can also relate this sand trap back to the child's life. So you can say, like, you just described that you felt like a lion uh, when you were able to, to help the person with treating their wound. Um, and so you described that the lion had a lot of confidence. Have you ever also experienced that in your life, that you did something where you had a lot of confidence? So try to relay it back to the child's everyday life. Um, so you enable the child to project onto the figures, but then also bringing it back home, bringing it closer, like have you ever experienced this in your own life? All right, thank you for, for taking part in that. I hope that you were able to, to make your own sand tray. Um, I would like to move on and talk a bit about the play therapy process. Now, first of all, the most important thing of the therapy process is, of course, to build a relationship and to build a relationship with a child. So that means that you as the therapist or you as a person working with children really need to connect with that child on their level. Um, you need to become their friend. Um, and you need to be your authentic self as well. You need to be able to have fun together with this child um, and also create this, this um, idea or, or, or to really truly uh, create this setting that is safe. And the child should know, okay, what are the boundaries? What is allowed in this, this playroom and what is not allowed? Um, because that creates safety and that creates uh, trust. So first of all, building the therapeutic relationship. So um, you have to take into account that the first time that you meet a child, that child is going to ask themselves. The first thing that they are going to ask is, am I safe? Um, am I able to interact, engage with this person? Am I going to be able to handle this? And will I be accepted? So you need to make sure that this child feels safe. And how do you do that? By becoming the child's friend. Sometimes the child may show um, a bit of resistance in the beginning when you're still building this relationship, and that's normal. But try to engage and really try to do different things with the child as well and focus especially on relaxation play, like we've mentioned at the beginning, relaxation play, um, doing things that, that helps the child to soothe, to, to, to feel relaxed, and uh, that breaks a lot of tension. So focusing on those type of activities. Now, um, uh, during the, when you're building the therapeutic relationship, it's also important to allow the child to make decisions as well. So it's a balance between being directed, you as the therapist, choosing the activities that we are going to do and allowing the child to choose the different activities that we are going to do. So there needs to be a continuous balance. Uh, when you enable the child to choose, they can experience a feeling of mastery of, oh, I can make choices, I have control. And those are things that are very important to develop the child's sense of self. Um, so yes, of course, making emotional contact with the child starts at the very first moment that you meet the child. And it is a constant process of building this relationship throughout the play therapy process. Now, also part of this initial first step, this first phase is assessment. So during the first couple of sessions, you as the therapist will assess and observe, assess and observe, observe the child's play. So you will see, for example, is this child able to, to make contact, to maintain contact with me, or is this child distracted? Uh, does this child show any interest in what we are doing? Do they use any defense mechanisms? What does their body posture say? Do they show any resistance, withdrawal? Um, can they express their emotions? Is it appropriate the way that they are expressing their emotions? Um, you can look at cognitive aspects, like can the child express what they are feeling and their thoughts? Can they, does, does what the child is saying, does it make sense? Is it logical? Um, can the child follow directions? Can the child make choices? Uh, does the child have a sense of what's right and what's wrong? Um, can the child take part in creative techniques, in techniques that promote the sense of self? And what is the child's view of him or herself? Um, what is the temperament type? Are they a bit slow paced or are they focused more on relationship? Are they assertive or very timid? 
Can the child separate from their parents when they come into the, the therapy room? Can they say bye and can they do the session with you? Or are they constantly aware of where are the parents? I can't separate from my parents. What is the child's social skills? Can they form relationships with others? Can they form a relationship with me? And of course, how does the child engage and interact with other people? Um, does the child know how to play? Has the child has have previous experience in playing? You know, does, does, does the child know how to symbolically play with things? How does the child present him or herself in this therapeutic uh, situation? So those are the type of things that you look at. And then you create a treatment plan according to that. And you also discuss that with the parents and together you make, uh, you do treatment goal planning and decide, okay, this is what we are going to work on during the play therapy process. Of course, contact um, making is very important, sensory and bodily awareness. Um, now, when a child uh, goes through a traumatic experience, they tend to shut themselves off sensorily. So sensor, sensory is, of course, involving our senses. Now, when a child goes through a traumatic experience, they shut that part of themselves off because they want to protect themselves. They don't want to feel anything. So by focusing on a child's sensory and bodily contact making, so the senses, involving the senses and becoming aware of your body, um, you really help the child to become more aware of their emotions, the emotions that they experience at a specific moment. And you help them to learn strategies, how to ground themselves, how to promote self-support, which is very important. We will look at this aspect a little bit later and also at emotional awareness, coping strategies and expression. Now, I just want to skip to part, to step four, self-nurturing. Now, what I've mentioned in the beginning, I used an example like when parents are going through a divorce, separation, a child might think that it's their fault that their parents are separating. And so they might, you know, have these thoughts and feelings about themselves, like I'm not worthy. I caused this, this is all my fault. And they might have this extreme guilt and shame that they experience because of what happened. Now, self-nurturing focuses on really self-maintenance, helping a child to develop positive self-talk, help them to develop a positive self-esteem and sense of self, help them to, to love themselves again and to be able to nurture and comfort themselves. Um, so we need to, as I've mentioned before, we need to identify a child's thought patterns. For example, magical thinking, thinking that it's all their fault. And we need to focus on that, reframing those ideas, but also helping them to promote self-support and doing activities where they might find comfort and help them to accept themselves again. Now, the persistent inappropriate process is, of course, um, unhelpful behaviors that reoccur, um, things that you need to address throughout the therapy process, um, or when a child has any unfinished business, you address that throughout the therapeutic process again. And termination of therapy takes place once the treatment goals have been achieved and you follow the child's process. So I cannot say to a parent that, okay, you can bring your child to play therapy and we will take eight sessions and your child will be okay after that. We follow the child's process and we cannot rush a child or uh, place a child under pressure to, to work through things that they are not ready to work through. So that is why it's very important to follow the child's process and to allow them ample time to, to work through the things consciously or subconsciously. So that is, that is why we cannot say that there's an X amount of sessions that a child needs to do. Uh, I just want to refer you to the, to the slide on this, the picture on the screen as well, where you see there's a decision grid. Now there's a coping track and an invitational track. Now, this is sort of gives a guideline to a play therapist, like how to work with the child or where's this child in his or her process. If a child has weak ego resources, a low sense of self, you would mainly, first of all, focus on the coping track, right? Helping the child to develop positive coping strategies, um, promoting self-support, self-maintenance, and focus on that, building that with the child. You will include things like psychoeducation, uh, focus on developing skills, positive coping skills, and then you would um, focus on 
on, on teaching pro-social skills. So that is a coping track. So if you see that this child is not yet ready to address the trauma or to work through that, or they are using a lot of defense mechanisms, they don't want to uh, project or they don't want to go deeper into what happened, that is fine. You focus then on building uh, the child's coping strengths and building their ego resources. If, however, uh, opposed to that, if you see that the child has a strong sense of self, they have positive coping skills that they use, you can go towards a more invitational approach where you focus on building a relationship, of course, and then um, you know establishing and making sure that there is enough resources and safe of safety with the child. But you can then gradually move on to confronting the trauma. But make sure, of course, that this child has the necessary scoping skills in place uh, to deal with that. So that's just an overview of the two tracks that you can follow. And you can go from the coping track to the invitational track. Or sometimes when you see you confront the trauma and the child um, is showing, is perhaps regressing or it might be too threatening, you can move back towards the coping track. But to make sure that um, you don't press pressure the child, but follow the child's process. All right. Now, I quickly want to focus on emotional awareness. Now, as you've seen, it is one of the steps in the play therapy process, creating emotional awareness and, of course, helping a child to express their emotions in a safe way. But first of all, you need to help a child identify what emotions are. How are you feeling is a very pointed question, especially if a child does not know what emotions are. Um, so the important thing to, is to help a child to identify their emotions. Um, it helps them to develop an emotional vocabulary. It helps them to identify empathy and identify their own emotions and the emotions of others. It helps them to self-regulate. So what I would usually do is I would play games with a child and introduce emotional awareness in a playful manner. For example, this poster that you see on the screen, how are you feeling? This is a poster that I would paste against the wall and I would take a piece of clay and ask the child to throw the piece of clay against this poster. And the face that the child hit, for example, he threw the clay and he identified angry or he hit angry. And then I'll ask the child, okay, so what makes people in general feel angry, sad or scared or whatever the emotion was that the child threw? And then the child can say, mm, uh, people get angry or my dad gets angry when we are stuck in traffic. You know, the child might say something like that. And then you can ask the child, okay, so what does your face look like when you are angry? Uh, what does your dad's face look like when he's angry? So then the child can actually mimic, can mirror and show you what happens to, the to his face when he gets angry. So he would really make a very angry face. And then you could say, yeah, I can see you are angry. I can see that is what the face looks like. And then you can ask the child, what happens to your body when you feel angry? And so the child can say, oh, when I feel angry, it feels like my heart is pumping, it feels like I can't breathe, it feels like I, you know, I'm struggling to, oh, I just, I have this feeling, you know, and the child can show you what happens to their body uh, when they feel angry. And then you can ask the child, okay, so have you ever felt like this in your own life? Has anything ever happened to you that made you feel angry? Or have you had this experience before? And then the child can, you know, sort of relate and think, yeah, yeah, I remember one time my dog, he ate this very special ball that I had and I was very angry. And then you can engage in a bit of dialogue and conversation with the child. Okay, but so tell me what happened and uh, tell me what happened to your body. But tell me uh, how you resolved this conflict, for example. But so it's really just a way of, uh, helping children to identify what emotions are. You can play different games like memory, uh, emotion memory, you know, the memory game where you flip over the cards. You can play Uno, for example, where a different color, if you draw a red color, you have to tell me about a time that uh, you saw somebody was angry or tell me about what makes people angry. Always start from the general and then move towards the more personal, relaying it back to the child's personal life. 
um, you can also make a collage and you can tell the child, okay, for homework, I want you to make a collage uh, page through different magazines and I want you to cut out all of the pictures that you can, the different faces that you see of somebody who's maybe scared or somebody who's unhappy or angry. Just try to get as many faces as possible and this helps to really promote emotional awareness. Once you have done that, once the child has uh, developed a bit of vocabulary, emotional vocabulary, you can move on to developing coping skills. Now, this is a visual way. This is psychoeducation that I use. So this is more focused on the coping track, of course, but helping children to identify that they have different options, they have different things to do uh, when they are in a situation. So what can you do when you feel sad? What can you do to make your, yourself feel better again? A child needs to learn that there are different possibilities and that they can actively take responsibility to change how they feel or to help themselves regain an emotional state where they feel, okay, I can go on with the rest of my day. So these are things that you do with the child, you explore with the child, um, and you help them to identify the things that they also like. For example, when a child uh, is sad, what would that child do then to feel better again? In my own life, for example, when I feel sad or when I'm a bit down, I would listen to music or I would try to do a bit of breathing exercises or I would, you know, I would pet my dog. That makes me feel better. So it's really something, small things that a child can do to learn how to feel better once they've experienced an emotional state. So this is just a, a, an example of the different coping tools. And as I've said, you explore that together with the child. So I have these different cards of coping tools and I have the different faces, of course, and we talk a bit about emotions. And then we say, okay, what can we do? What can you do to feel better? And then we try out the different options to see what helps for a child and what is something that they feel comfortable with. Even simple breathing exercises are very important just to help a child regulate their emotions. Grounding exercises, as you can see here on the screen, you would select a card and these are the actual materials that I use during the session. So I would have a pile of grounding exercises, hop like a frog or crawl like a bear. The child can draw one of those cards and they can do that. So it's a bodily movement involving their body and then trying to ground themselves, to calm down, to get back to a state where they feel, okay, I can continue, I can continue with my day. Or doing a stretching exercise, like be a tree, or doing a power hug, uh, tensing all your muscles and then releasing, squeezing yourself and releasing. Um, these are things that help you ground, to feel like, okay, you are on top of this tree and there was a storm and this tree was shaking and now you've managed to climb down and you're on the ground again. Whew, now I can breathe, right? So now you feel grounded again. So those are very important things that you teach a child in a playful way as well to deal with their emotions. You also make use of psychoeducation, like you've seen with the coping strategies. You have different uh, tools that you can use. It helps a child to understand their emotions a bit better because it's the, an emotion is such a complicated construct. We need to be able to help a child to understand it in a visual way uh, but also break it down into the language that a child can understand. So these are also materials that I use with a child. For example, when a child has a lot of anxiety, you can say anxiety is a normal emotion. It's your, your body's defense system uh, trying to tell you that something is the matter, right? So it just helps a child to gain better understanding of what they are experiencing at the moment. Relaxation and breathing techniques are very important. Um, because it helps to involve your senses again, but it helps you to calm down, to regulate your emotions. It helps to deal with anxiety if you are anxious about something. It helps you to, to stop, to take a step back and to reassess and to think, how am I going to react in this situation? And these are skills that children need to learn how to use it and how to, to do it. Because the next time they get angry, they will say to themselves, okay, wait, wait, what did I learn in play therapy? Uh, I learned that I have to stop first. I need to take a couple of breaths. I need to, you know, take, the, take a couple of deep breaths and then I need to try to calm down. Maybe I can do one of the other grounding exercises that I learned. 
Now, this is obviously the ideal because in a lot of situations, you know, you get angry, you freak out and the situation is a total mess. But hopefully by doing these things, practicing it in a safe environment, the child will learn to rather focus on grounding themselves and regulating their, their emotions before they react to a certain uh, situation. So these are just examples of the type of breathing and relaxation techniques that you can do during play therapy. And now I want to do a breathing technique with you. Um, so I am going to switch on my video. Please feel free to do it on your side as well, to switch on your video, but I'm going to show you the butterfly breathing technique. Now, this technique is something that you can do anywhere. You can do it while sitting uh, on your seat, wherever you are. Try to just really focus on your breathing and try to get your heart rate to have it uh, pumping a bit slower. So what you do, the butterfly, is first of all, feel free to switch on your video if you like. It would be nice to see the different faces and that I'm not just talking to myself. <laughs> but so you can... You can uh, show your, your palms like this and you can wiggle your fingers a bit. So these are going to be the wings of our butterfly. Now what you do is you turn your hands around like this and then you move your thumbs together and you connect them. So you connect your thumbs and there you have your butterfly. Now how this technique work is when we uh, in, uh, so first of all, rest your butterfly on your chest. When you inhale, your butterfly flies up in the air and it just sits there for a moment, flying up in the air. And when you exhale, the butterfly gently rests on your chest whilst you exhale and it gives a gentle tap. So let's try that again. When you inhale, Butterfly is up in the air and it floats up and it just rests there for a while. And when you exhale, the butterfly rests on your chest again and you slowly exhale. We're going to do that two more times. So we go in, keep your breath for a moment, and you exhale, tap, tap, tap. And last time we go in and we exhale, tap, tap, tap. Now that is something that you can teach a child to do at any stage during the day when they feel a bit stressed or overwhelmed to do a breathing technique like that. Now, moving on, um, what? to expect when you take your child to play therapy. Now, first of all, uh, you as a parent might experience some issues with your child's behavior or your child has gone through traumatic experience and you don't know how to support your child. So first of all, um, you come in for a session, an intake session, you have an intake uh, session with the parents where you discuss your child's psychosocial functioning and you talk a bit about the child's development and you gain a bit of background history. You also uh, go through a questionnaire where you work through um, uh, different things and you look at the child's behavior and across the child's development. Now, the session provides an opportunity to discuss what the parents are experiencing and the issues that they have. And you can also discuss with the parents what they can expect from, from play therapy. After the intake session, the child needs to be prepared that they will go to play therapy. So the parents need to prepare the child. They need to tell them that they are going to go and see a lady or a gentleman, that they are going to go there once a week to play. So that the parent really needs to prepare the child. Now, when the child comes to me, when it's during when it's the first session, I usually say to the child, okay, in here, in the playroom, we are going to play a lot. And I'm going to help you to learn about your feelings. And I'm going to help you to start to feel better. And in play therapy, you will come to a place that's just for kids. There's, there's going to be different toys that you can play with and a lot of the ways that you like to play with. Um, you can choose. Uh, you can choose sometimes that we can talk or we can just play. It's your decision. Um, this is a place 
where we spend time together and we spend special time together. It's just a time for you and me. Play therapy will help you feel better because when you get to play, you get to be with somebody who cares about you and you get to choose what you want to do. Sometimes the playing will be fun. Sometimes it will be serious. Um, but it will be just a time for you where you can feel happy or you can feel sad or you can even feel mad at times. That's okay. Um, and so it's really just acknowledging and validating and creating a safe space for the child. Of course, you will adapt this um, to the child's age level, of course, and um, just make the child feel at ease. Um, of course, the duration of the sessions, I've already discussed. We don't say it's going to take these amounts of sessions because we follow the child's process. Um, but important to remember that things might get worse before they get better. The child's behavior might be um, might get worse, or the things that you thought might be addressed through play therapy, it will, it can, it can explode and it can become worse. Why is that? Because usually when you touch on these emotional things, um, it's like opening something, it's opening a can of worms. And sometimes these things can come out and you're more aware of it. All of a sudden, this child is more aware of what emotions are, how it feels, how it feels in my body. Um, I mean, it can become overwhelming, but that's why it's important to bring the child back again and to continue with this process because the child will learn the skills, how to deal with things, or they will be provided the opportunity to work through their traumas. But it's important to, to continue, even though things might get worse. It's natural, it's, it's normal for it to, to, to be that way um, and for it to play out that way. And you will see that sometimes children will also show some hesitation and resistance and they don't want to go back. Um, but as the trust grows and as the relationship, the therapeutic relationship grows, the child will become more comfortable um, and the bond will strengthen and the child will become more creative and, and will become more verbal in their play. All right. I want to conclude with a uh, doing a drawing activity. So I hope that you have a piece of paper and pencils close by because I want us to do a drawing activity. And this activity is called the fantasy of a safe place technique. Now, this is something that helps a child to relax. Um, it helps them to ground. It's also seen as a relaxation and a grounding exercise and it supports self-support. So when a child is going through something difficult or when the child is experiencing, oh goodness, I'm very anxious at the moment. I want to calm down. I want to regulate my emotions. I need to ground myself. Even as adults, it's something that we can use just to ground ourselves again. So this is called the, 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 the safe place technique. And what I want you to do is I want you just to relax I want you just to take a couple of deep breaths. Feel free to do the butterfly, but just take a couple of deep breaths. And then I want you to close your eyes, or if you're more comfortable keeping your eyes open, I want you just to fix your eyes on a specific uh, something. And I want you just to listen to my voice. I'm going to give a bit of instructions on how to draw your safe place. So when you are ready, just take a couple of breaths. I'm going to start with the guided fantasy. So I want you to imagine that you could go to a safe place. Now, this can be a place which you remember from your past or a place where you live now. It could also be a place which you create for yourself. It could even be on the moon. It could be any place. It could also be a place which you already know and which you want to make better for yourself. Imagine you could go to that place. And I want you to look around you. What does it look like? What do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? Do you taste anything? And what do you do in your safe place? And when you are ready, I want you to draw your safe place. Nobody has to understand it. 
It can be in lines, it can be shapes, it can be forms, it can be in any color. And I want you now to draw that safe place. So let's take about five minutes and draw your safe place. And then after that, I would like us just to briefly share on our experiences of drawing this safe place. So I'm setting my timer and I would like you just to take that piece of paper and crayons and draw your safe place. And you can start with that right now. Please, if you have any questions, don't mind sharing it in the chat box or speaking up. Let's take another minute.
All right. Would anybody like to share their drawing or just reflect on how it felt to draw this picture? Please feel free to unmute yourself and to switch on your video. I know that we are almost out of time, but uh, you can rejoin uh, using the same link um, if, if time uh, gets to us. Yes, anybody who would like to share? I will. Yes, yeah, thanks, Carol. Um, so my favorite place in the whole world is under the sea. So I just did a very simple drawing of swimming under the sea with all the fish. And it was so nice doing it because it sort of took me back to being under the sea again. Mm -hmm. And this turtles and the shoals of fish and the beautiful seaweed and coral. So it's not a very good picture, but it's just was a lovely experience. And tell me, Carol, how does it feel being under the sea? You say it's a nice experience. How does it feel being there? It feels like the safest place in the world because you're breathing and you're hearing your breathing the whole time mm -hmm. and you become totally relaxed and it's the most beautiful place. So for me, when I can't sleep or if I'm not having a good time, I imagine going back to being under the sea, especially to get to sleep and mm -hmm. swimming with nature and the silence except for the breathing and the beauty and the colours and the fish. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. It really seems like it has this soothing effect on you, right? When you go back to that and as you've mentioned with the breathing, which is so important, but also focusing on all the different senses, what you can see, the turtles and the seaweed and the fish and, you know, just that experience of hearing total silence, just focusing on your breathing. It sounds like a very soothing, safe place. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Okay. Is, there, is there anybody else who would like to share their safe place or just their general experience of, of drawing? Um, a picture like this. Well, hi, Marika. I can share. I don't know if you want to see my drawing. It's not yes, very good. You can share your screen, Laura. <laughs> uh, you can okay. It's on your video. Yes, I hope you can see. I had no crayons, so I'm oh, just yeah? using a little book. So uh, it was a good experience. It's uh, it's supposed to be an island. Mm -hmm. I was picturing Bora Bora actually and oh. sitting by the beach and uh, drinking a colada. So that was my safe space. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, you, I think you had mentioned what do you hear? So there are lots mm -hmm. of birds, people surfing. That was my experience and my safe place. And I think for me, it's like it's a vacation mm -hmm. when you're on holidays, very relaxing, you don't have any problems. Uh, you don't have to pay any bills. You don't have to do any work, any school. So for me, that's like my safe place. Mm, thank you so much for sharing, Lauren. And it just, you know, that feeling, I think, of the waves crashing and just that total relaxation and feeling the sun uh, coming down on you. It, it sounds lovely and very much relaxing. So thank you so much for sharing, Lauren and, and Carol. Uh, I want to encourage you anytime during this week or in the future when you feel that, oh goodness, I feel a bit anxious, I feel a bit stressed out, when you're struggling to cope with your current circumstances, go back, revisit this safe place and focus on your breathing, focus on your senses, trying to think, okay, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? What do I taste? It really helps you to, to ground yourself and really just help you to regulate those emotions, to, to calm down, to breathe. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, we are running out of time, but um, as I've mentioned, you can just rejoin with this link if you, if you want to. If you have any questions, please share your views, share your questions, or if you have any feedback or reflections, um, now is the time, the opportunity to do so. So please feel free to unmute yourself switch on your video if you want to, to share or to ask anything. Uh, that is it's the, the time for it now. Yes. 
Is there a raised hand? Yes, Marika. Um, yes, just a quick one. When would you do this activity with the child? Would you advise that like, you do it after, at the end of every session, or when you're closing? When would you do like the safe space? That's a very good question. So I usually try to incorporate a sensory and a body um, exercise uh, activity during every session because it really just helps a child to. Uh, get a better idea of their emotions and to become more aware of it. So it's something that I do during every session, even if it's just, um, even if we're just focusing on building a relationship, a relationship which are usually the first few sessions, I always do a sensory or body um, exercise activity. So build this into every session. You could do it um, at the end, just sort of to ground the child to make sure that the session ends on a positive note. Um, and that is usually why grounding exercise like this is it helps just to, you know, to, to settle and to have the session end on a positive note. So you can do it at the end. But at the beginning of the session, you can always do a breathing exercise together with a child, or you can incorporate, um, you know, one of those exercises uh, that I've mentioned, hop like a kangaroo or run like a cheetah or, you know, do a bodily movement exercise just to get the child all excited and ready for the session. So you can build it in into different um, times during the session, but the safe place I would do at the end as for the session to end on a positive note, but important to build in emotion, sensory uh, activities during every session. Does that answer your question, Lauren? Yes, it does. All right. Anybody else? I just want to thank you so much, Marika. It was really, really so well presented and so easy to understand. And um, lovely to see you, you doing this because you obviously have such a passion for it and for children. So it, yeah. was, it was really helpful so helpful for me thank you thank you so much for that feedback carol and yes it's truly just focusing on the power of play play is not a senseless activity it has so much value and i believe you know in in any situation where you work with a child it's absolutely it's their language and it's a way to engage with them and Anything you do by playing with a child, you know, even if it's just a menial daily chore that a child needs to do, you can really encourage them or get their interest, catch their, their attention by, uh, you know, saying, okay, you have to clean your room, let's make a game out of it. It's just really an a, a awesome way to connect with a child on their language. And that's why I'm a true play advocate and uh, really see as well in the therapeutic setting um, you know, the huge relief that it brings to a child, but also how relaxing it is and how to express difficult things, but doing it in sort of an, a comfortable, safe setting, doing the things that they like, playing with the type of things that they like to play with, um, it, you, it makes a huge difference. Um, it's such, a, it's such an unthreatening environment. Yeah, it's yes. so unthreatening and, yes. and fun and safe, like you said, safe. Yeah, and natural. It comes natural to the child because this is how they explore their world. Yeah. So no, it's it's really it's it's a wonderful it's wonderful to be able to to talk about this topic today. Anybody else? Any general feedback or questions? If not, I want to be mindful to your time. I see we are five minutes over our time, but feel free to reach out if you have any questions or if you want to learn more about play therapy or play-based interventions, um, or if you've missed something during this, this presentation, please feel free to reach out. And uh, I want to thank you so much for joining me today and uh, for participating in the techniques and uh, yeah, just sharing your views. I really appreciate it. I'm going to do a couple of these presentations over the next couple of weeks, um, but I'll keep you informed. And uh, yes, thank you so much.
and uh, I hope you have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Thank you.